Nearly everyone is familiar with the tale of Willy Wonka, the eccentric candy maker who invited children to his factory for a delicious tour. Yet few have heard of Mr. Wonka's efforts to start a new religion. It seems that his plans were nearly foiled by his love of chocolate. With lavish gifts of confectionery delights, Mr. Wonka managed to convince Veruca Salt, Violet Beauregard, Augustus Gloop, and Mike TV that he was God's last and greatest messenger. But good old Charlie Bucket remained unconvinced. Mr. Wonka, he said, can you give me some reason to believe that you're a prophet? Of course, replied Mr. Wonka. Just taste my everlasting gobstoppers. They're delicious. Surely the recipe could only come from God. If you don't believe my gobstoppers are from God, I challenge you to create something as delicious. Charlie was puzzled. It didn't make sense to him that tasty candy could be considered proof of prophethood. He tasted the gobstoppers again and again, but he couldn't make sense of Mr. Wonka's reasoning. One day Charlie went to confront Mr. Wonka about his perplexing argument, but the great candy maker was busy hanging a sign over his Wonka bars. The sign read, Thus saith the Lord, No one shall eat more than one chocolate bar per day. Mr. Wonka, said Charlie, could I ask you a question about the evidence you gave me? Of course, Charlie, replied Mr. Wonka, gobbling up a delicious Wonka bar. Pardon me while I have my lunch. Some people are convinced that Slugworth's candy is tastier than yours, and I know that a few of the Oompa Loompas have left the factory because they don't even like your candy. Do you really think that candy is the best way to determine divine truth? Well, Charlie, said Mr. Wonka, wolfing down another Wonka bar, if you ask the people who are still in my factory, they'll all tell you that my candy is the best. So yes, I think that candy is an excellent way to spot a messenger of God. By the way, could you pass me a few more Wonka bars? I want to eat at least a dozen. But Mr. Wonka, cried Charlie, didn't you just put up a sign from God saying that no one is allowed to eat more than one chocolate bar per day? Mr. Wonka shot a suspicious look at Charlie before saying, You're in danger of being turned into an eternal blueberry, Charlie. Don't question me. God will punish you. Besides, I was just about to put up my latest sign. Here Mr. Wonka placed another sign under his original sign. The new sign read, But this rule doesn't apply to Mr. Wonka. He gets as many chocolate bars as he wants. Charlie walked away in horror. He hunted down Veruca and said, Veruca, don't you find it odd that Mr. Wonka tells us that we can only have one chocolate bar while he gets as many as he wants? Blasphemy, cried Veruca. How dare you challenge Mr. Wonka? You're a rotten, mean child. I should shove you into the chocolate pond. Then Charlie ran to Violet. Violet, isn't it strange that Mr. Wonka gets special chocolate privileges when he's the one putting up the signs from God? I hope a vermicious knid swallows you whole for talking like that, Charlie, she screamed. You know that Mr. Wonka needs to get contracts with cocoa and sugar companies. They're not going to trust him if they don't see him eating chocolate constantly. So he needs to eat all that chocolate. That's why God gave him special moral privileges. Unconvinced, Charlie went and found Augustus. Listen, Augustus, I know you believe Mr. Wonka is a prophet, but all he's given us to prove it is his candy. And if you weren't so obsessed with candy, I don't think you'd find his argument compelling at all. And here we see him telling us to do one thing, while he does something completely different. Doesn't this bother you at all? Nope, rejoined Augustus, and he buried his face in a bowl of syrup. Mike TV is smart, thought Charlie. He'll listen if I talk to him. Charlie found Mike and said, Please tell me that I'm not the only one who sees that there's something dreadfully wrong here, Mike. Thousands of people have claimed to be prophets. Mr. Wonka has the worst argument of all in his defense, and he doesn't even practice what he preaches. Mike responded, Tell me more about it as I try to figure out this Wonka vision machine, Charlie. Here, just stand there while I throw this switch. Mike threw the switch, and Charlie vanished. Then Mike saw Charlie's molecules dancing near the ceiling. Sorry, Charlie. In order to put you back together, I'd have to turn on the television. But you see, Mr. Wonka told me to destroy people who criticize him. So that's what I'm doing. I have to. He's our prophet. 
He said so himself. Now, where can I find those apostate Oompa Loompas? It's safe to say that no one hearing this story will be impressed by Mr. Wonka's claim to be a prophet or by the perplexing defense offered by his uncritical followers. Yet how is Mr. Wonka's story any different from Muhammad's story? If we switch Wonka bars with women, the signs Wonka was hanging with Quran chapter 4 verse 3 and chapter 33 verse 50, and the argument from good candy with the argument from good poetry, we have a rough sketch of Muhammad's attempt to prove that he was a prophet. The Quran allows Muslim men to marry up to four wives, but Muhammad had at least nine wives at one time and he received a revelation from God giving him special permission to have more wives than other Muslims. Muslims today defend Muhammad by saying that he needed to marry the extra women because he needed to form alliances, even though most of the marriages had nothing to do with forming alliances. Muhammad's main argument for his prophethood was the argument from literary excellence. My poetry is better than your poetry, so my poetry must be the word of God. Most of his contemporaries were thoroughly unimpressed by his poetry. But even if they had been impressed, what would that have to do with whether it's the word of God? Sadly, Muhammad's followers, like Wonka's, absolutely refused to question him. And that shouldn't be surprising, since Muhammad ordered his followers to brutally murder anyone who leaves his religion. Never underestimate the psychological pressure of a potential beheading. <laughs>